up. Thank you so much for coming. Send me the bill later for that nice introduction. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so, uh, okay. So, what I'm planning to do here is uh, it's a little bit different. Uh, I would like to show you a way to write a web application that I, I think for, for some reason doesn't have so much uh, popularity. A lot of people don't, don't consider this a valid option. Uh, so before I get into the coding, I'm going to give you just a quick introduction just to set your frame of mind so that you know how this is, uh, this is going to work. So I'm going to use the socket I.O. protocol. Uh, I'm not going to explain how it works under the hood, uh, but all I'm going to say just to set you, you know, to, to relax uh, is that it runs on top of WebSocket. So, you know, that, that's all I'm going to say about how it works. Uh, there is uh, documentation for this protocol in uh, Socket.io. This is a mostly JavaScript-based uh, documentation. And then there's the, the Python port of it, uh, which is uh, uh, on Read the Docs. Uh, just so that you don't think this is an obscure thing that nobody knows about, uh, Socket IO clients are available for most platforms. Uh, so obviously, uh, the, the Python one, which comes into variants, uh, you can use it in, in standard Python and async IO. Uh, there's JavaScript, which, which is the reference implementation that was the first, uh, which runs in the browser or you can run in Node. And then there, there's a bunch of others. Uh, all, all the mobile uh, platforms have it. Uh, and I'm sure there are more that I, I don't even know about. These are the ones that I'm familiar with. Uh, that, that was the clients. Uh, for servers, uh, as I said, there's a JavaScript uh, reference uh, implementation. There's the Python one. Uh, there's the Java one. And those are the three that I know. There might be more. Uh, though for this, I only get about the Python one. That's the one that I use all the time. Uh, and it, pretty much it works like this. The client connects to the server, and unlike with uh, HTTP and REST and those uh, solutions, it's a permanent connection. It doesn't end, so it stays connected. So each time a client joins or leaves, the server detects that and then it gives your application a chance to do something about it. Uh, this, this one is probably you know, obvious. The client, since it's connected at any time, it can invoke an endpoint in the server. Right? The server exposes an API that the client can use. Uh, but the one that's probably you're not used to is that the server can also invoke endpoints in the client. The client also exports an API, and the server can uh, make calls into it. So basically, when you design an API for this, you are, it, it's a double-sided API, if, if you will, where you design endpoints uh, on both sides. And in fact, when the client connects to the server and they're connected, there's really not much of a difference between a client and a server. Both can talk to the other side, and you know, the, the lines are blurred a little bit. Uh, the only main difference between clients and servers is, as, is, is that there's one server and many clients. And for that reason, the server, when it invokes endpoints in the client, it has superpowers. And it, it can decide if it invokes an endpoint in one specific client, uh, maybe all of clients. It, it can broadcast, and, and then all the clients get this endpoint invoked. Or it can select a subset, you know, whatever makes sense for the application, and only invoke an endpoint in those. OK, so now you know pretty much everything there is to know about this. So, so with this, I'm going to build a multiplayer chess game. Uh, I'm, I'm going to try to get as far as I can here in one hour. Uh, and if, if I don't make too many typos, I, I think there's hope. Uh, if not, we'll see. Uh, so uh, in my console, I, I have uh, I created sort of a starter project with some boilerplate so that I don't waste a lot of time. Uh, so I'm going to very quickly show you what I have. Uh, on the Python side, in terms of dependencies, there are four uh, dependencies. Uh, the, the socket IO uh, server and client, 
uh, Uvicorn, which is a, a very nice async I.O. web server. That's what I'm going to use for, for this application. Uh, and then there is a chess package that I'm going to use to uh, validate moves and that type of thing. And then finally, there is uh, Watch God, which is a, uh, a, a uh, little process that watches the, the source code. And any time I make a change and save the file, it will restart the server. So if, if you're using Flask, pretty much like the reloader in Flask, uh, so, so that I don't have to restart it every time uh, by hand. So uh, server.py is going to be my server. There's nothing in it so far. Uh, and then I have the, the front end, which is in the public folder. And here I have a, a, a one, one HTML file, which has a, uh, a, a title, and then four dependencies for the JavaScript side, uh, which are jQuery, the socket IO client for, for the browser, and then two related to chess, one to show chess boards, and one to do uh, move validation as well on this side. And that's it. And then uh, I have an app.js, which is what I'm going to write, which if I remembered, yeah, this, is, this should be, it, it, it is an empty file, so, so this uh, doesn't exist yet. Uh, and then uh, what else do I have here? I have some CSS, some images. These are for, for the dependencies for, for the chess stuff. Uh, and that's pretty much it. So. I'm going to start my, uh, my uh, reloader, which basically I'll tell it to watch this, this function, the main function in the server. And now, now it's going. So even though there's nothing yet, then uh, when, when I start putting stuff, it, it'll reload. So uh, let's see. So I'll leave it there. In case I make a mistake, I'll, I'll see it there. So I'll, I'll just leave a little bit of that window. Uh, I'm going to activate the environment here. So let's create a server. So, oh, sorry, not async.io, socket.io. I'm going to import async.io and uvcorn. And then I'm going to create uh, the socket.io instance. Uh, it's going to be the async flavor, so, so this, uh, once again, you don't have to use async I.O. if you don't want to. Uh, you, you can use, uh, there's, there's a class called server, just server that implements the same functionality but for traditional uh, Python. Uh, and uvcorn is a ASCII server. For, for those who are not familiar, ASCII is the async uh, improvements over WSGI. So uh, there, there's, there's a specification for ASCII, and uh, uvcorn supports that. So to connect the Socket.io server with uvcorn, uh, Socket.io provides a wrapper that converts this, uh, this application into an ASCII-compliant application. Uh, there are many other wrappers for other things. You, you can do WSGI and, and a bunch of others, Tornado, and et cetera. So I'm going to create an application uh, with the ASCII wrapper and pass my Socket.io instance to it. And now I can just run the application. And it restarted, and everything's looking good. So um, I have a, a bunch of static files, right, the, the front-end files in the public folder. As a convenience, this ASCII wrapper allows me to expose those, uh, those files so that during development I can easily serve them to, to clients, to browsers. And of course, now, now I have to admit that I lied because this is going to use HTTP, right? The files are going to be served over HTTP, uh, but, but none of the application lo logic will use HTTP. Uh, so uh, this is going to be the slash URL. Uh, it's going to map to the public folder. Uh, just like that, I think. Oh, I'm sorry. Static files. Very good. So if I now run this, I'm getting it, you know, the empty front end. Uh, so this is looking pretty good. So before I get into the chess stuff, 
which you may or may not find interesting. I'm going to show you something that I hope will interest most of you. This is something that is incredibly difficult to do with HTTP. I want to show how many users are using the application at any given time. So, so think about it. How would you do it with HTTP? And if, if I think about it, I get a headache because it, it's near impossible. It's very hard. So let me show you how to do that this way. So I'm going to start with the, uh, in the index file. I'm going to add a place to show this, this number, the number of users. So in the, an H2, and it's going to be something like that. Uh, because I'm going to dynamically change the zero here. I'm going to put it in, a, in its own element. And I'm going to call it uh, user count, let's say. So then I'm, I'm going to use jQuery to change this uh, when appropriate. OK. Should be very good. So uh, actually, I'm going to do the client. So the client needs to connect, right? I haven't done any, any connections yet. So in the client, uh, public JS app, I'm going to create in the same way uh, I did it for the server. I'm going to create an instance of socket IO for the client. Uh, in the client, it's actually very easy. You just do that, and that's it. Uh, the IO comes from the socket IO client. It's the main function that creates the instance. And if you don't pass any arguments, it connects to the same server that the page came from. So it uses the, the URL in the address bar. And you don't have to specify a connection URL. So now uh, th this client now connects, and it remains connected. So in the server, the server is going to detect that, and it's going to want to notify my application. And uh, whenever there's the, these types of notifications, uh, the socket IO calls them uh, events. So I'm going to create an event, and I'm going to call it connect. And the name of the event is, uh, is important. But basically, the, the SIO.event decorator uses the name to know, you know which, which events are uh, you know, handlers for uh, for diff different aspects of the application. Uh, there are other ways to create events if you don't want to use, you know, if, if you don't want to be forced to use a, a given name uh, for, for your functions, there are other ways to create them, but this, I find this uh, the, the most uh, convenient. And the connect handler gets uh, two arguments. Uh, the SID, or session ID, is part of the socket IO protocol. Uh, each time a client connects, it gets assigned a unique identifier. This is called a SID. So uh, I, I get the SID number assigned to this client that is connected. Uh, and then environ is the, basically the, the request. Uh, so, so you get information about headers and whatever else, uh, cookies, all that stuff. Uh, and uh, you can use this for authentication, you know, th those type of things, uh, which I'm not going to do here. But you know, it's there in case you need to, to do that. That, that is a dictionary, and uh, it's uh, uh, formatted according to the, uh, the whiskey specification. Uh, so anyway, uh, here I, I still don't have the, the chess stuff going, but I know that for each user, I want to record, I, I want to assign the user to a game. So I'm going to have some storage, which for this exercise, it's going to be an in-memory dictionary. For a real application, it, it might be a database, it might be Redis, that type of thing. But I'm, I'm going to simplify. And here, I'm going to just write something for, for this user. So for now, I don't have a game yet. I'm going to put a game later on. For now, I'll, I'll just put that. And then, uh, likewise, there's going to be a disconnect. The disconnect gets the SID of the user that's going away. And what I can do here is remove it. Oops. That's it, right? So, so this is the cool part. I want to have an endpoint in the client that updates the number of connected users in any time a user comes or leaves. And now I start getting into the async part. So I need to make this an asynchronous function. And I'm going to do an emit. 
which is the, the method that makes a call into the, uh, into the other side. Both sides can do emits. So I'm gonna call this one uh, user count changed. How about that? And then as an argument, I'm going to pass how many users I have. And then, oh, okay. Uh, so you, you don't have to uh, worry too much because when I save, I'll, I'll be told if I made a mistake, I'm prepared for this. So don't, don't worry, don't, don't, uh, don't, you know, don't worry too much. And this one still needs the async. There we go. Okay. So what I'm doing here is invoking an endpoint in the client, which I didn't write yet, and passing an argument, which is a number. Okay. So let's go to the client. Uh, in the client, the syntax is a little bit different. Uh, user count changed. And then there's a callback that takes the number. There we go. And then when this is invoked, I can, uh, I can take the uh, user count element, which was the span that had the zero, and then set a new text to the number. And fingers crossed, let's see if it works. So, so now, now we get one. So I'm gonna start another one. Now it's two. So I uh, see if I can do this. Maybe some of you don't believe me. So now you can see two at a time. I'm going to start a third one. Right. So 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 look look at the number three on the left. I'm going to go ahead and close one of the two that have that I have on the right. You see, this is you know so easy and so amazing uh, and. If you had to do this with HTTP, I, I, I would not even know how to start, right? It, it's super messy, it would be super messy. So, so anyway, this is basically the way things work. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to continue with this and this is going to be the, the, the style. I'm gonna start uh, deciding on things that I need to call on the other side and then go to the other side and implement them. So I'm going to spend maybe a minute putting up a chessboard on this page. Hope this isn't too boring. Uh, so there's gonna be a board element and then in the application, uh, the game is going to be of class chess. So, so I need two things. The, the game is going to be what validates moves and then there's going to be a board which is what displays through it, uh, the game. And this is chess uh, board. And this one takes the ID of the element where the, the board goes. So let's see. So, so that's the board, it's uh, kind of big. Um, let's, let's make it a little bit smaller. Um, Uh, let's make it uh, 400 pixels. Okay, that's better. Uh, okay, so, uh, so so we have a, a board. Uh, I'm going to set some options in this board. Uh, first, the position. I'm going to set it to whatever the game uh, the the game is set to, which is going to be initially the the, the initial position. Uh, for, for, for those who don't know, there, there's a notation for chess positions that's called FEN or FEN. Uh, it's a standard position. It records everything about a chess uh, position. Uh, so basically that, that's what these libraries use. Uh, so I'll set it to that. And then I'm going to make the, uh, the PCs uh, draggable so that we can start moving, moving things around. So now I get pieces, uh, I can move, but there's, there's no, uh, nothing to validate yet. 
So, so uh, now every user gets a board. Uh, so what I want to do now is I want to assign users as they come into the application to a game. And I, I don't want to spend a lot of time on that since it's unrelated to the topic. So I, I'm going to do something simple. Uh, each pair of users, when they connect, they, the first one will be white, the second one will be black, and then when I get another one, I open a new game, and then I keep doing it that way. So as the user comes, I do white and black, and white and black, and so on. So let's do that in the server. So I'm going to have a list of games in addition to a list of, or a dictionary of users. And for, uh, for a game, I'm going to use a dictionary with the, uh, the ID, the SID of the white player. So, so this, is, this, for example, will be setting up the, uh, the game for, for the white player. So I set white to the SID of the connecting user. The black, I don't have it yet. I, I need to wait until someone else connects. So I'll set it none. And then I'm going to set up a board, which will be the, uh, the, the chess logic, uh, which I'm going to get from this package chess. So chess board. And that's a game. So, so this is going to be the case of a white, uh, when, when uh, the player that goes to the white side joins. So uh, this is going to apply when uh, either uh, I have no games, so the first player ever, or if the last game uh, has a black player already assigned, right? So in that case, we have this. And then I'm going to add it to my list, okay? And then the, uh, the black case, my game is going to be the last game that I have in the list. I'm going to set the black player to the SID. Uh, and I think that's it. I can put the game now. I, I, and then I assign the dictionary to the user. So there's going to be two users in the system that, ha that point to the same dictionary, right? So, so these are the two users that are playing the game uh, against each other. Uh, so I need now to tell the front end that the game is ready to go. So I'm going to use a new endpoint that I'm going to call new game. And then I'm going to pass the fen position, the, the description of the board, to, uh, to the client. Uh, so that is going to be gameboard.fen. You can see that all these libraries use the, the same standard. They're, they're all kind of the same in that respect, because this is a widely available standard for chess. Uh, and then this one, the, uh, the user count changed. I just said emit, and it went to everybody, right? Uh, but this one, the new game, I want to send only to the user that connected. So I send it by using the, the SID that was assigned to that, to that client. So I send it to that, that person only. Uh, one more thing that I can do now that I think about it is uh, the player that gets the black, uh, typically on a game of chess, the, the black pieces are at the bottom for, for the black player. So. Uh, I'm going to just very quickly set the color. And then here, I'm going to send two arguments, which in the Python side, you have to send as a tuple. Uh, so send the fan and the color that was assigned to that player, so that then the, the front end can turn the board around if necessary. OK? Uh, Undefined game. Where is it? Yeah, games. Okay, very good. So on the client side, now we need to implement new game. This is, this is the endpoint that starts the game. And this function gets the fan and the caller. And what I can do here is I can take the game object and uh, set the fan 
to the position that server sends. Um, so th this, this library uses load to set a position. And then this is in the, in the hidden part, the, 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 uh, the package that does the logic. I need to update the board as well. So for the board, I'm going to say, and of course it uses a different API for this. Um, I'm gonna do it like that, it uses the position. And then the board also has orientation and you can set it to white or black. So I set it to color. And there we go. So now let's bring our two browsers. I think I had an, I had an error. Where is it? Did you see it? In the Python side? 21? Oh. There we go. Sorry. I wasn't that well prepared, looks like. Okay, let's see if that works better. No, there's still something going on. Hmm? I'm so sorry, I, I don't see it. The else? No, this is fine. It's probably in the in the other side. Oh, I, I didn't save. Really? Okay. Let's see. Sorry about that. Yeah. So, okay. So now I refresh two, and the second one gets to black. Okay. So, so that now uh, players are assigned to games. If more players join, they're going to get different games, right? New games. So what I want to do now is to, to make a move, and this is, this is actually the, the most complex part of this. So I'm going to make a move on one of the front ends, and then that client is going to invoke an endpoint in the server. The server will validate the move, and then the server needs to invoke an endpoint in the other uh, front end, the one that's playing with the first, to update the move, right? And, and then the process will reverse and then you know, the, the, the two clients will switch places and that's how we get the game going. So let's see how that works. The, uh, the chessboard package has an on drop uh, that you provide a, a callback. So, so each time I move a piece and I drop it in a different place, then uh, it will call this function. And it sends me the two locations, start and end, of the piece that was moved. So what I can do here is try to move. And this is actually very easy. So you just give it the, the start and end squares. And, and these are, if you look at the, uh, in case you're not familiar, you can probably see or maybe not, but each square has a coordinate, which is a letter and a number. So the from and the to are each two characters, a letter and a number. And that, that basically determines from where to where you're, you're moving. It's actually pretty simple. So I, I make the move and then I can check if the move was accepted. So if the move was not accepted, I can, and this is part of the, this package uh, API, I can return snapback, and that will undo the move as, as invalid. Um, the other thing that I need to do is I need to make sure that the, not only that the move is valid, but it's valid for the color of the pieces that this player is assigned, right? So we, we don't want the white player to make a legal move for the black. 
So for that, we need to check that uh, it is the turn of this player to move, not, not the other player. So uh, for that, uh, let's see, we can do uh, turn, uh, actually, no, it's easier. I know the color already. So I can, I can put this in a, in a variable. There we go. So, so now we, we know the piece uh, color for this player. So if, and then uh, this, uh, this board, uh, the, the, uh, the chess package returns, and it returns a letter, either W or B for white or black. So um, what I can do is check the first, uh, the first letter, which is how you can, you can make sure that it's the same, you know, it's the player's turn. And if, it, if it's not, once again, snap back. Okay, what did I do now? Hold on. Yeah. I got it, I got it. More? Perfect. Uh, so, so this, now if I try to move, this is it. Oops. What happened now? Is it? Okay. So my, uh, my linter isn't doing, yeah, line. Turn, uh, Okay. So let's put this, this on white, the other one on black. So now if I move the black, not accepted. If I make an invalid move, not accepted. The valid move is accepted. And this one cannot move even if it's a valid move for, for the white because it's, it's the black. So now that I have a valid move, I can send it to the server. So from the client, it's the same thing, emit. I can call it move made. And I pass the, the two coordinates from and to. Yeah, of course. And then on the server, I write another event, move made. Uh, the events on the server always receive the SID of the client that sent the event as the first argument, and then you get the arguments for, you know, the, the arguments that came with the, uh, with the event. So here we have from and to, and actually from is reserved in Python. So let's do from square to square, something like that. Uh, so here I need to validate again that the, the move is valid. Uh, always when you do validation, validation done in the client is for user experience, but the real validation is done in the server. So we need to repeat the same thing. So uh, actually, let's get the game. So that's the game. Uh, the turn here is game board dot turn. And here, uh, this, this chess library uses a Boolean. So true means white, false means black. So I'm gonna do white. Oops. Else black. And then I need to know whose color is this player uh, playing. So I can do white if game white matches the seed for the event. And if not, it's got to be black, right? 
So if turn matches the, the piece color, then, then we're good to go, at least on, on the turn aspect. This player is allowed a move right now. So the next thing is to try to make the move and see if it flies. So in the chess package, the easiest way that I found to make a move is to use this notation called UCI, which is actually a concatenation of the two coordinates, so four characters. And then once you have a move object, you can check if move is in the list of legal moves for the game at that point. So if all of this is true, then the, the move is valid, and then you can actually apply the move. Uh, there we go. So, so now the move is, uh, is made. So there are a, a, a few considerations here. There, there might be uh, an invalid move or the player trying to move when it's not their turn. So in all those cases, we need a way to tell the front end that the move was not accepted so that the front end can then uh, get a new move from that user. So this is another cool feature of socket IO, which kind of matches what you can do with REST uh, or HTTP, where, where you send a request, you always get a response. So you know if that request worked, right? So, so when you emit an event, you can also get a response, uh, which I haven't used yet. So on the Python side, you send a response by returning something from the function. So you can return uh, the position. So if, if the move was not accepted, I'm going to return the same position and the board in the front end will revert to whatever it was before. Uh, so, okay, no errors, hopefully. And then uh, on the client, this return value is given, because this is JavaScript, you get it as a callback. So you can add a function at the end after your arguments and this function gets whatever you return, uh, you, it, it gets it as argument. And if, if you want to return multiple arguments, you return a tuple from, uh, from Python. So here what I can do is I can uh, basically set the, uh, do I have that? Actually, I do have it, yeah. It's these two lines. I, I need to repeat this. So. I'm going to take these two and I'm going to write a, a little wrapper function. Update. Like that. And then here I don't have to repeat myself. So this is going to undo the move if it's invalid. So the part that remains is now the, uh, the client now has an updated board, uh, but the other player now needs to know what the move is. So if after all, this che all, all the checks we, we apply the move, now we can emit, uh, I'm gonna call it op opponent move, and I could send the from and the two squares, but, but really I don't have to. I can, I can send the, the entire board since it's, it's really a line. It, it's actually a pretty short uh, representation. So I'm going to send the, the fen of the updated position. Uh, but uh, this needs to go to the other player. So I, I need... Uh, I need to find out who that is. So the other player is going to be game white if we are black. Else, this is going to be game black, right? Yeah, I'm not using it yet, perfect. So then two, other player. So, so this is a, 
a private message that goes to the other player in that game. Okay, so opponent move. So now back in the client. Opponent move. This also receives a, a, fin, a fin notation for the board. And all I need to do is, once again, update the board. Because everything else uh, happens on its own, right? Uh, when, when the other player tries to move, uh, we are going to reevaluate if it's their turn to move. So all I need to do is update the board. And uh, one of the things that this fin notation has is whose, whose turn is. So that, that's one of the things that, uh, that are included in the, in the representation. So based on past experience, I don't trust myself. I bet I made some mistake here, but let's see. So, oh, there you go. Okay, so yeah. So, but now, now, now the, the, real, the real challenge is the black response, and they, they also get it. So, so basically, we're done. We have a game here, right? Uh, so the things that I'm not going to do here, because there, there will be boring, is detect when the game ends. You know, all of that you can do uh, you know, fairly easily. It doesn't have any challenge. Uh, one thing that I didn't mention, though, that I'm going to show you, uh, this, this callback thing that I did, this, uh, this return, returning the, uh, the position, not only applies to invalid moves, but uh, chess has uh, some complex moves where uh, typically when, when you're playing you know, with a physical chess board and chess pieces, uh, some moves you need to move two pieces. Uh, for example, one is called castling, right? So, so uh, in, in computer chess, uh, the convention is that you don't move the two pieces. You only move one. And then the computer knows that the only possible thing is you know, that the other piece needs to be moved to. So the computer moves the second piece. So by returning the updated board position, I basically, I, I solved that. And I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna just, just play a quick game against myself, just enough to get to a position where I can do a castling. So here, here, uh, these, these are the, the, the white king and the white rook are going to do that, but uh, according to computer chess standards, you only move the, the king. And then, because I'm returning the updated position, the, the chess package in Python, who understands the logic of that move, it moved the, the rook as well. So returning that position refreshes the board. So even if I didn't have chess validation logic in the client, I will still get the correct move because the, the server is updating it. Make sense? So time, okay. So what I want to show you now is that you can do a Python client as well. So I'm going to just create a new file. So this is going to be a client that's going to be playing chess as well. So somewhat similar. Uh, I'm going to create. So this one, the, uh, the server I showed you, the async.io version for this one, just for fun, I'm going to do a traditional you know, standard Python, no, no async.io uh, since you know, they, they kind of work the same. So I'm going to connect. Uh, in this case, I don't have context like the browser has. So I need to give it the location of the server. And then because this is all event-based, there's really nothing else that I need to do in the main thread of the application. So all I do is wait. And, and now events are going to start showing up. So for example, uh, remember the, uh, th this uh, user count changed event that was invoked every time a user joined or left. So we can do that one. User count changed. Uh, and then 
new account. On this side, you don't get to see it because there's only one client, right? We're looking at this from, from the client side. So you just get the arguments. And here we can, we can just print. Something like that. So if I didn't make any mistakes, oh, I did make a mistake, actually. I forgot to run the main function. There we go. It's restarting. That's not my fault. So let's bring, so let's say I'm going to start one more here. So each time someone comes or goes, the, the Python function runs, and I, I get a chance to you know, do something uh, regarding that, that event. You see? So and we, we can uh, actually very easily complete uh, the game. So we had a new game. And this was uh, fan and color. So here I can have a, uh, a board. There we go. And the board uh, is set with set fan. And then for the color, I'll just just put it in a, in a variable so that I know later when, when it comes uh, the time to, to make a move. Uh, so global uh, piece color. There we go. So now, if, if we get white, now it's our turn to move on, on, on this Python client. Uh, but I don't know, right? It, it could be white or, or black. So what we can do here is just make a function, move if, if it is my turn. Um, so turn is going to be white if board dot turn, else black. Remember that uh, in the, the Python chess package, it, it's a Boolean. So I'm going to, just to make it more readable, I'm going to switch it into white and black. And then if piece color equals turn, that means that we need to move. So I can print the board. Luckily, uh, there, there's a, a handler that prints a text version of the chess board when I print it. Uh, I can show the color so that you know who you play with. And then just prompt for a move, just like that. So, so we, we can get the move uh, with, with this UCI notation for characters. So, so the first move will be E2, E4. That will be the, the first move that I've made with the whites, something like that. And then uh, I'm not going to worry about validating because the, the server validates anyway. So, and, and then the server will let me know if the move was uh, invalid. So. Move made was the event. And, and then I needed to pass the from and the to. So here I need to split this four character uh, move into two parts. The first is the first two characters, and the second is the, the third and the fourth. And this is when the server receives this, validates, notifies the other side, and then returns in, in that callback to the, to the JavaScript client, it returned the updated board. So for this, I can do something like this and then put a, a function, which will be kind of similar to JavaScript, but, but we Pythonists, we, we hate this, right? So, so there's a more Pythonic way to do this, which is instead of emit, you can use call. And call combines an emit with Waiting, the, uh, waiting for the callback. And then 
you get the response, like, like you, you're making a function call, but it, it's a function call across to the other side. So now what I can do is uh, I can take this board and update it with this position. This position could, if, if the move was valid, now it's the turn of the other player. Uh, but if the move was invalid, it, it's my turn again. So what I can do here is I can say, again, um, move if, if it is my turn, right? So, so then if, if it's not my turn, then this is gonna end, and you know, eventually we're gonna get an event when the other side moves, uh, which is actually the last thing that we need to do. Opponent move, what's it called, I think, and it receives once again the fen, and when I get that, all I need to do is same thing. Update the board, and then if it is my turn to move, prompt for, for a move. Let's see. Okay, something's not working. What is, what did I miss here? Set fan. Great. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna debug this. It's exciting. Let's see what I'm getting. Oh. Okay. There we go. So I'm gonna make a move, uh, but uh, let me. Let's, let's put this, this JavaScript one on the other side. So this is the black for that game. It might be, yeah, it might, it might be, let's see. This is blue. So I moved the, uh, the the JavaScript client, and now it received here the, uh, the move. I can respond e7, e5, and you know now now Python and JavaScript playing with a Python server in the middle. Uh, so I think th there was one more thing that I wanted to show. Only there was time, uh, and there isn't. I think. Uh, I assume you have some questions, so I'm, I'm gonna leave like five minutes for questions. So uh, I'm just gonna tell you what I was gonna do next. Uh, the idea was add another option where if, if you're playing a game here, you can specify that you wanna watch all the other games that are going on. So uh, that will basically put you in a, what, what Socket.io calls a room. So there was a room called Watchers. So all the clients that want to watch games ask the server to be put in that room. And then the server, each time there's a move, in addition to all the notifications to the white and the black, black players, it sends a notification to the watcher's room so that the, the client can show you know, all the boards. So basically that, that was the, uh, the idea uh, that I, I, I don't think I have time to complete. It has a, a bunch of uh, you know, HTML you know, to set up that, so it will be a little boring and I will make mistakes and so on. Uh, but anyway, uh, what I can do is I, I can actually complete it and then uh, all, all this code that I wrote, I'm going to commit to, to this. Uh, this is a GitHub repository. So if you want to play with it, uh, you know, after the talk, I'll, I'll commit it there and you can play with it. Uh, so, so yeah, I'll, I'll leave it there and I think we have five minutes for questions. Thank you. <laughs> So as Miguel said, we have five minutes for questions. You can line up at one of the two mics here, or if you're in the middle somewhere, you can just put up a hand and I'll come around with a microphone. 
Hi. Hello. Thank you. That was a brilliant talk. Um, one question for me that may be a bit big question to answer, but can you tell us a bit more about the drawbacks maybe of using uh, web sockets over HTTP? Maybe code complexity, scalability, uh, I don't know. Drawbacks of, of using web socket Instead so, so of in, in general. Yeah. Uh, so uh, one thing that I will, I, will, I will say is that WebSocket is not appropriate for an application that is not a single page application, right? Be because each time the page changes, the, uh, all the connections are, are you know, go ongoing. They're, they're broken, basically. All, you know, the, all, all the connections are disconnected. So each time you switch the page, you have to connect again, so it, it's impractical. Uh, and, and that applies to Socket I.O. as well. I would not use it for something that is not a single page app. Uh, WebSocket on its own doesn't have reconnection logic. So if, 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 if you are on your phone and you know, you're connected via WebSocket and somehow you lose Wi-Fi, you know, there's nothing in the WebSocket that will reconnect you. So it, it's kind of annoying. Uh, Socket IO does have reconnection logic, though. So if, if you're using this and you know you pass through a, uh, a no, no signal zone uh, or no Wi-Fi zone, uh, when, when you get the signal back, you will be automatically reconnected. So uh, so this has, has, in my opinion, some some interesting advantages over plain WebSocket. Hi, Hello. Uh, thank you for the presentation. It was a really great overview. Uh, in there, you demonstrated that you can get a response for a WebSocket event. Is that the feature of WebSockets or a feature of Socket.io? This is a feature of Socket.io, not a feature of WebSockets, no. Okay, thank you. Yeah, in fact, the, uh, the, the WebSocket API, it's, it's very basic, pretty bare. Uh, there, there isn't much you can do except sending and receiving. You know, that's pretty much it. Uh, so, so, yeah, th this does a lot of stuff on top. Hi, thanks for the talk. Mm -hmm. um, one question. Would you ever find yourself in using uh, web sockets over Socket.io? Would you find a use for web, just web sockets and not to Socket.io? I never use WebSocket uh, alone. I, I, it's been years since I've used it on, on its own. Th this is way more you know, useful, uh, much more high level. Uh, so, yeah. And another question, um, does it support binary data, raw binary data? Like uh, Socket IO supports binary data, yes, absolutely. You can send images. You, you can send a video stream, for example. Uh, at, at a different talk uh, a couple of years ago, I showed how to record audio, and then stream it from the client that's recording it to the server, for example. So audio data, images, video, all of that works. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Any more questions? Going once, going twice. All right, looks like there's no more. So let's have another round of applause for Miguel. Thank you. Thank you so much.